All right, so as promised, we're going to continue our discussion of human beauty in the world as will and representation by Arthur Schopenhauer. Uh, I'm just going to dive right in and read this long quote. If uh, you haven't watched the previous video, you should do that first because I'm going to be using a lot from that. I'm going to be relying on your understanding of that for much of this. Okay, the human, sorry, that a beautiful human form is produced by nature must be explained in this way. At this, its highest grade, the will objectifies itself in an individual. And therefore, through circumstances and its own power, it completely overcomes all the hindrances and opposition which the phenomena of the lower grades present to it. Such are the forces of nature, from which the will must always first extort and win back the matter that belongs to all its manifestations, right? So this is stuff we already said in previous videos. He's elaborating a little bit here, right? The human will is the highest form of will that, that we know of, right? The highest objectification of will. And he's sort of making a bit of an argument, I guess you could say here, for that assertion. Uh, we've risen above all these forces of nature, right? Gravity, rigidity, the animal kingdom, the, the vegetable kingdom. We, we you know, we're at this sort of, you know, this is old school thinking of hierarchies, of course, uh, uh, in nature. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, you know, it's kind of based on Plato's great chain of being. You might want to look that up if you're interested. Uh, yeah, at least I see a lot of parallels between that and here. Um, but this is what makes the human form, uh, a beautiful human form, very unique as an object of art. So in, in works of art, the artist has, uh, I guess, quite a task to perform. So again, in this video, I told you last one, a preview, uh, we'll talk mainly about human beauty. Uh, well, actually, I would say mainly. A lot of this video, you're going to see in a minute, we're going to get into some epistemology, theory of knowledge, and maybe even what you might call theory of mind uh, in Schopenhauer, and how that relates to works of art. And then it's going to come back to sort of uh, a, a close of his, his notion of human beauty, uh, character, grace, how those all fit in together. Okay, so uh, picking up where we left off, right? Again, the human will is, or the human form, beautiful the human form uh, is an example of the will at its highest grade. Further, this phenomenon of will at its higher grades always has multiplicity in its form. Even the tree is only a systematic aggregate of innumerably repeated sprouting fibers. And so all these fibers might, you might say, have their own will, and they all come together to, to you know, become part of the roots of the bark and, you know, blossoming up into this huge tree, right? This, you know, big redwood tree or something. Um, this combination assumes greater complexity in higher forms, right? The, the tree is more complex than the individual fibers. And the human body is exceedingly complex. Uh, it's a conceivably complex system of different parts, each of which has a peculiar life of its own, vita propria, uh, you know, proper life, life proper. It's subordinate to the whole, right? So it's subordinate to the whole system. This also might sound a bit like Aristotle. We were talking earlier in the semester, for those of you who are students of mine taking this class, um, earlier in the semester we were talking about Aristotle's teleology and how uh, the, the world, the universe is almost like a system of aims, and each aim is subordinate to other aims. Uh, and uh, right, so in, in arts, I, I, you know, the, the uh, costume designer is subordinate to the person who wears the costume, the actor, and the actor is subordinate to the person who wrote the play or the screenplay. And the person who wrote the screenplay is subordinate to, um, I, I suppose, <coughs> the director, the producer, and the people who actually make the film, and they're subordinate to the audience, which is odd, you know, it's kind of odd, you, you might think, you know, because it's all for the entertainment of, of the viewer. Uh, and so there's a similar hierarchy, kind of hierarchical thinking going here, uh, but based on more of a complexity, uh, these higher forms uh, are, are more complex. Now that these parts are in the proper fashion, subordinate to the whole, um, and coordinate to each other, they all work together harmoniously for the expression of the whole. Nothing superfluous, nothing restricted. All these are the rare conditions whose result is beauty and the completely expressed character of the species. So how do we know when something's beautiful? 
right? He's just described this process in nature, how a tree sort of uh, arrives at this harmonious equilibrium amongst its parts. But how is this in art? One would suppose that art achieved the beautiful by imitating nature. But how is the artist to recognize the perfect work which is to be imitated? So he's pushing back on Kant, on Aristotle, on a whole line of tradition of uh, theory of art, of aesthetics, that says art completes or imitates nature. Um, he's not completely far. Let's, let's, let's read further and see where he goes with this. He's not completely divorcing art and beauty from nature. But where's he going with this? Right, so if, if, if one says that we're imitating nature, how is the artist going to recognize a perfect work which is to be imitated and to distinguish it from failures? If he does not participate the beautiful before experience, this is turning into a Kantian, uh, uh, this is turning a Kantian direction. Um, remember Kant said in previous lectures, we talked about how Kant said that judgments of the beautiful are a priori. Schopenhauer's making the same claim, that before we even see a work of art, we already know what beautiful would be. We, we already have in us this anticipatory uh, uh, intuition. Uh, and so when we see the art, it's, it's, art, it's recognized immediately. Uh, it's, it's not something that is a posteriori, you know, known from experience or known after the fact, after experience, but it is a priori. It is something that is, is understood directly and intuitively <clears throat> and is known regardless of any contextual differences or circumstances. So, um, so it's known it's beautiful as anticipated before experience. And besides this, right, it, 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 art is not imitating nature exactly. Has nature ever produced a human being perfectly beautiful in all his parts? It has accordingly been thought that the artist must seek out beautiful parts distributed amongst a number of different human beings and out of them to construct a beautiful whole. A, per a perverse and foolish opinion, for it will be asked, how is he to know just these forms and not others are beautiful? So if we're an artist and we're making a, we're, we're painting a painting or making a sculpture of a human being, and we're trying to make it, as Schopenhauer would, would, would recommend us to do, the most perfect, the most beautiful, the most ideal, version of that human being as possible. Um, how do we know it's perfect and beautiful and ideal? We somehow have to know this ahead of time. How do we know it ahead of time? He's gonna to get to that in a second. But it can't be from looking at, oh, well, that person has a beautiful arm, right? And that person has a beautiful torso. And that person has a beautiful, you know, good looking booty, right? And, and so on and so forth. I won't get into all the, the, the juicy details, right? And then we're just gonna take all these perfect parts and just assemble them together. Uh, he'd say that, that won't work either. Because how will you know that when you get it all together that it's beautiful? You already have to have this conception. You already have to have this intuition ahead of time. No knowledge of the beautiful is possible purely a posteriori and from mere experience. It's always, at least in part, a priori. That in, that in part, part I, I'm not sure I'm happy with it. I think I know why he says it. I'll explain in a minute. <clears throat> but I think it's a bit problematic, okay? So all, always, uh, knowledge of the beautiful is at least in part a priori. Although quite different in kind from forms of the principle of sufficient reason of which we're conscious a priori. These concern the universal form of phenomena as such, as it constitutes the possibility of knowledge in general, the universal how of all phenomena. And from this knowledge proceed mathematics and pure natural science. Now, this is a rather obscure quote, uh, but what he's saying in the second half is that on the one hand, as in the previous slide, knowledge of the beautiful is known a priori. Right? It's, it's just, it's a concept that we already are hardwired to r recognize when we see it, okay? Uh, in a certain sense. Partly, <laughs> as he puts it, right? Get to that in a minute. But the other half here, right? He's saying it's not the same, and this is Kantian as well. This is a bit like Kant. Um, it's not 
the kind of judgment or knowledge that's based on the principle of sufficient reason. We talked more about that in previous videos on Schopenhauer. What is the principle of sufficient reason, right? We're looking for a cause. We, we have this conceptual framework that gives us a reason or a cause or an agency behind all the phenomena that we see. We're not doing that when we make uh, our judgments of beauty. Knowledge of beauty is not based on that principle of finding reasons or conceptual explanations, right? These concern mathematics and pure science, natural science, okay? And that, that concerns the how. How does this work, okay? But this other kind of knowledge a priori, right? The knowledge of the beautiful, which makes it possible to express the beautiful, right? If you're an artist who, to create works of art, concerns not the form, but the content, okay? So the principle of sufficient reason is the form of our experience, right? Uh, it's the, it makes, it constitutes the possibility of knowledge in general. Very Kantian, right? Go and review your Kant videos if you forgot about this, but right, we have categories that make, that, are, that make experience possible. They're part of the necessary condition for the possibility of experience. We wouldn't have the kind of experience that we have, the kind of coherent experience that we have if it wasn't organized, if our senses and our, the inputs, the sensory data, was not somehow organized by our, conce our conceptual apparatus, our mind, which is, 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 is organized through these categories, right? Our experience is organized through these categories, okay? <clears throat> and so <clears throat> this makes our experience possible, okay? This other kind of knowledge, which makes possible to express the beautiful, concerns not the form, not the form, but the content of phenomena. It's not the form, it's not how it comes, like space and time, that's another uh, Kantian uh, uh, condition for experience. Everything that we experience has to take place in space and time. That's the form of the experience, right? But what, what's the content of experience? What's the content of all these phenomena? Um, so th this, this knowledge of the beautiful does not concern the how of the phenomena. How is it that I'm having this experience? But the what, right? Again, the content. That we all recognize human beauty when we see it, but that in the true artist, this takes place with such clearness that he shows it as he, had, sorry, it, as he has never seen it and surpasses nature in his representation. This is only possible because we ourselves are the will, whose adequate objectification at its highest grade is here to be judged and discovered. So this is his answer. This is his answer to that question. How are judgments of beautiful possible a priori? How are they possible a priori? For Kant, remember, his answer is that we make this assumption, maybe it's a wrong assumption, he doesn't really dwell on it too much, but we're assuming that um, there's this sensus communis, right? This common sense, and that when I say something's beautiful, it's something that if anybody who is a rational being such as myself were to have the similar experience would also make the same judgment. So it's not based on my personal biases and conditions and desires, right? But he's saying no. Um, it's based on not that. It's based on the fact that we ourselves are will. We are this will which we see objectified. So when we see objects of art, we're seeing lower or higher gradations of will, vegetable life, uh, plant life, animal life, human beauty, right? All these gradations of the will. And since we have a direct, uh, uh, immediate experience of our own will, we understand that the will, what the what what the what it is to have a will, and we understand that these are expressions of will, or manifestations of will. So that's how knowledge of the beautiful is possible directly in a priori. Um, thus alone have we, in fact, an anticipation of that which nature strives to express. So we can kind of see where the plant is going, right? Why is it doing what it's doing, right? It's not an active thing the way we are, but as we observe the plant over the course of the seasons, we see it growing to a certain uh, a goal of completion, right? <clears throat> and the true genius, this anticipation, is accompanied by so great a degree of intelligence 
that he recognizes the idea in the particular thing. So the artistic genius can see that plant and, and not just see it as a particular plant, but as a manifestation of all those plants and all those types of manifestations of the will, right? And he's able to represent this in a work of art. <clears throat> And thus, as it were, he understands the half-utter speech of nature and articulates clearly what she only stammered forth, right? So Michelangelo sees that block of marble that everybody threw aside and thought was a kind of a piece of crap that nobody could make anything great out of. And he says, no, I see that there, there's, some, there's something beautiful that can be chipped away from that. I'm going to uncover it. I'm going to reveal it. This great work of art, this artistic masterpiece. David, right? Michelangelo's David. He expresses in hard marble that beauty of form which in a thousand attempts she failed to produce. He presents it to nature saying, as it were to her, that is what she wanted to say. And whoever is able to judge replies, yes, that is it. So this anticipation of the ideal it is the idea, right? Remember, the idea, he, he's, he's, he's got his own wacky form of uh, Platonism here. So he's when he says idea, he's talking about the plat in, a pl in a sort of platonic sense, the plat platonic idea. So th there's the anticipation of the ideal, which is, which is heightened in the, the genius. The, the, the genius can see it clearer than we can. The artistic genius sees it clearly and can present it to us so it's easier to spot. It's the idea, so far as it is known, a priori, at least half. Right? Why does he say half? I think I know why, and I'll explain it after I finish this quote. Um, it's, it's known at least half, and it becomes practical for art because it corresponds to and completes what is given a posteriori through nature. I think that's the other half, okay? So the a priori part is that we have our individual will, and we experience as individual. The individual is an illusion, right? We have, you know, we're all together, we're all one, for, as far as Schopenhauer is concerned. We experience ourselves as individual will. And from that, from that standpoint, uh, that gives us the same priori direct, uh, uh, immediate intuition to understand the will itself. And so when we see it, we see it manifested in works of art, we see, it, we see those as beautiful. Right? So that's the sort of half that we are given, the sort of half, but that is complete. It becomes practical for art, for art because it completes what's given a posteriori through nature. The possibility of such an anticipation of the beautiful a priori of the artist, artist and its recognition a posteriori of the critic lies in the fact that the artist and the critic are themselves the in itself of nature. We are will. We are all, we are all will. Right? We are the in itself. The will which objectifies itself. For as Empedocles said, life can only be known by life. Only nature can understand itself. Only nature can fathom itself. And only spirit can understand spirit. So we're spirit. We see that. We see that spirit, whether it's a vegetative spirit or animal spirit or human spirit. We see that. And because the will, the world will, this, the, the world as a will for, for Schopenhauer is the in itself of nature, right? And again, just to sort of complete my thought in the first half, <clears throat> the idea is known a, a priori at least halfway. It's completed. It's there. That intuition is there, but it's drawn out of us in the experience of a work of art. So that's the other half. Now, back to the point about um, the in itself. We talked more about this in previous videos, so maybe you should review those. Uh, because I'm not going to spend too much time on this, right? But this this goes back to the old, age-old, well, age-old, particularly, uh, particularly uh, uh, um, pertinent in the modern period uh, problem. I wouldn't say age-old problem, but uh, definitely a modern philosophy problem since, since at least Descartes, you could argue further back. But here's the problem. What is the in itself? Schopenhauer thinks he solved the problem in a very unique way through his idealism. Again, I'm not spending much time on this. Review the first video if you want more. But the idea is that I have this experience or what Kant would call a representation. Schopenhauer calls representation sometimes, but uh, 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 for him it is what's real. Now, I've got this representation of the world. There's this object out there which is causing me to see it. It's, 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 it's giving me sensory data. 
right? That's processed somehow by some mechanism and, I, and I'm allowed to understand it as a tree that I see out there. Now, philosophers, at least since Descartes, have been trying to figure out, well, how do I know that my experience of the thing is at least similar to, if not exactly like, the actual thing, the thing in itself? And philosophers, I won't review all this stuff. Again, you can review previous videos, um, have come up with various solutions on how do you bridge the gap between the subject, the subjective experience, and the object out there. Well, for Schopenhauer, there, the object out there, this is a big mess. There is no object out there. The thing in itself is your experience, right? So he just cuts out all this out there stuff. You are will, and your experience of the world is the objective pole, and your subjective feelings and your direct intuitions are the subjective pole, and the end of the story, that's it, right? So back to our, um, back to our presentation, um, we are the in itself of nature. Because we are the in itself of nature, we can see that will in other things. We can see that will coming to fruition in other things, in works of art. Now getting back to human beauty, um, with a few comments on, on uh, other types of beauty, right? The adequate objectification of will through a merely spatial phenomenon is beauty in the objective sense. So when we're dealing with the object, right, that complete representational pole, <clears throat> beauty is subjective <clears throat> and it's because it's based on <clears throat> completely spatial phenomenon, which I guess you could measure mathematically. That's one reason you could call it objective or it's just simply an object for, for a subject. A plan is nothing but such a merely spatial phenomenon of the will for no motion and consequently no relation to time belongs to the expression of its nature. Now he admits that its development takes time, right? These vegetables don't just appear on the earth as they are. They have to complete um, you know, a cycle of development. But that isn't really a part of some sort of personal history of each individual plant, right? Uh, it has, uh, so what makes uh, uh, this, this uh, uh, plant you know, a, a bell pepper and, and, and this one, uh, you know, this piece of fruit, a, uh, uh, an orange, right, for him, uh, has nothing to do with any point or period in its history, okay? Its mere form expresses its whole being. So the way it presents itself formally, spatially, the way it looks to us, uh, expresses its whole being and displays it openly. That's not so with human beauty. That's not so for us says Schopenhauer. Brutes and men require further for the full revelation of the will, which is manifested in them, a series of actions. And thus the manifestation in them takes on a direct relation to time. So it's not just a spatial relation that exemplifies our will. It's a relationship to time. Where is he going with this? Why does he say this? Right? Thus, a beauty is the adequate representation of will generally through its merely spatial manifestation. Grace is the adequate representation of will through its temporal manifestation. So beauty is a product of, or a, a property that is exemplified through space. Grace has to be given also this extra element of time. It's, it's primarily temporal. That is to say, the perfectly accurate and fitting expression of each act of will through the movement and position which objectify it, right? So how does the human will move itself in such a way through each of these different transitions and movements uh, to further objectify its purpose, its underlying intent, right? The will that underlies it. So grace is a grace he seems to be saying here, I, I would argue he is saying, unless, he, you know, unless I'm missing something, grace is, is a purely human quality, right? I mean, I, you might be different. You might say that a horse or some other animal uh, might exhibit as well. He does say brutes, so I don't know. But certainly humans and brutes, 
they have they can be graceful. Okay. Grace consists in every movement being performed and every position assumed in the easiest, most appropriate, and convenient way, and therefore being the pure, adequate expression of its intention or of the act of will, without any superfluity, which exhibits itself as aimless, meaningless bustle, or as wooden stiffness. Grace presupposes as its condition a true proportion of all the limbs as a symmetrical, harmonious figure. For complete ease and evident appropriateness of all positions and movements are only possible by means of these. Grace is therefore never without a certain degree of beauty of person. The two, complete and united, are the most distinct manifestation of the will at its highest grade of objectification. And we've already said enough about the, you know, different grades of objectification of will and all this stuff. Um, but I'm thinking, when I, I couldn't help but think when I was reading this, of some of the things he said about architecture, which we went over in a previous video. Um, you know, this is obviously different, you know, but the sort of coherence of the parts of the building and how they sort of interact, the gravity and the rigidity, um, it seems like um, it's very analogous to what he's saying here about human grace and uh, human beauty. Okay, well, this is the last slide here on this video. We'll end the video here. Uh, and then the next video, we've got some interesting stuff coming up. More, uh, he's going to elaborate a little bit more on what he means by idea and how it's different from a concept, right? When we look at a, when a work of art and we see it as a manifestation of a platonic idea, uh, you know, the will uh, trying to uh, reach some sort of completion, and this intentional completion, uh, we're going to elaborate on that more uh, in the next video. How is it different from a concept, right? And sort of the Kantian, uh, Schopenhauerian sense. But let's wrap things up. This is the last thing I think he's going to say, uh, at least that we're going to talk about in this course, about human beauty. So not only are humans able to exhibit a certain amount of grace, but we also have character, right? This is also what separates us as subjects of art from other subjects of art, like plants, animals, architecture, things like this. Character. The character, although as such it is individual, must yet be ideal. That is, its significance in relation to the idea, platonic idea, of humanity generally. So when I have a portrait of a Salvador Dali, right, or Che Guevara, or, or Albert Einstein, or Steve Jobs, right, if it's an iconic portrait, it's supposed to be significant not just as an expression of them and their character but also of humanity generally that must be expressed comprehended expressed with special prominence apart from this representation is a portrait a copy of the individual as such with all his accidental qualities and even the portrait ought to be as Winkleman says the ideal of the individual I love this I think it's an interesting concept and uh I think there's something to it, honestly. I got sort of the cards on the table here, um, but it's tough to to really prove, right? It's really something like, ah, oh, you just you either get it or you don't. And, and maybe I'm going on a limb here, so I'm going to try to help them out with some of these examples, right? Uh, we mentioned this, I think, in the last video when we first introduced the concept of human beauty. Like all modes of art for Schopenhauer, some modes of art present themselves to us and they appeal to us in a more subjective sense, that subjective pull of the willless subject. And some works of art appeal to us in that more objective sense as representations of some, some platonic ideal. And it seems like when we're making portraits of human beings um, and we have to represent this character, it's almost exactly right down the middle because we, on the one hand, we want to represent humanity generally. How do you do that? with a picture of Dali, right? We also want to represent that person, the individual, that Salvador Dali. So what, how could you do this? Again, I'm going out on a limb here. 
and, and this is not fair, I think, to these people. I don't know their whole story. I know a lot of them are super controversial, right? So I might get in trouble for some of these <laughs> comments that I'm making, but just you know, bear with me. Again, I don't know a lot about these people and I'm just using these examples as, as illustrative. So Salvador Dali, right? Um, this portrait of him, right? It sort of exhibits the zany, quirky, weird, wacky, surrealist artist, right? He is Salvador Dali. He's the only Salvador Dali. There are none really like him. If you don't know much about him, uh, I'm surprised, but I find that my students are pretty culturally illiterate. If something didn't come out in the last, like, I mean, in their lifetime, or even in their lifetime, they probably have heard of it. Um, so look him up. He's a weird, zany character, okay? Weird guy, eccentric as you could be. Uh, this, you know, artist, famous painter. And, but yet this photo, maybe also, not only is it a great representation of him and his character, but also how does it, how does it relate to the idea of humanity generally? Don't we all have a weird, quirky, zany side, maybe? Maybe we don't, but this is, again, me trying to make concessions to Schopenhauer, right? The weird, quirky artist in it, right? The maverick in us, the innovator, right? The one who, the visionary, right? Again, maybe Steve Jobs wasn't all these things, right? Again, I don't know a lot about him. I'm not a huge fan, to be honest with you. Um, you know, from, from, my, from, my, from my sort of, you know, very limited knowledge of him, I think he seems like most of these guys kind of overrated. But anyway, this is, this is the iconic, the Steve Jobs portrait. You think of Steve Jobs, most people think of this picture. So it sort of encapsulates him, it's iconic Steve Jobs, and it also is, you know, maybe the entrepreneur, the entrepreneurial spirit in all of us, right? The rebel, right? The, the rebel, again, another controversial figure, Che Guevara, right? This is the iconic image, this is the one on all the t-shirts that all the, the hipsters like to wear. Right, but also sort of maybe in general the notion of rebellion against authority and and and, and you know, uh, uh, you know power of the people type of you know militancy and and this is sort of the zany quirky scientist you know Einstein you know as this fun yet kind of trouble you know there's sort of sadness in his eyes right I think this is also a great iconic image of Einstein. Anyway, so so I think I've said enough. I've exhausted these <laughs> examples as much as I can. Uh, and I've said enough about uh, Schopenhauer's view on uh, human beauty, and so we should better we better stop the video here. And again, uh, in the next video, we'll pick up uh, right where we left off. Here, we'll talk about uh, what he means by Platonic ideas. We'll get more into the details of that. Uh, we've already talked about that before, but uh, we'll dive in a little bit deeper uh, and how this differs from uh, conceptual understandings, symbolic understandings, and allegorical uh, understandings. So all that good stuff uh, coming up in the, in the following video, uh, so stay tuned for that. See you on the other side.